You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. The idea was that the frontier would be settled by people from the United States and, of course, from Mexican people in attempt to defend the region. So, yes, definitely Mexico opened the door to the entry of a population who later on wanted to remain separate from Mexico. Hello, and welcome to episode 381 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Texas stands large within the United States. At 268,597 square miles, or thereabouts, Texas physically stands as the largest state within the 48 contiguous states, and it's the second largest state by both physical size and by population. The vast and varied landscapes of Texas loom large in our American imaginations, as does Texas culture with its barbecue, cowboys, and larger-than-life personality. But before Texas was a place that embraced ranching, spaceflight, and country music, Texas was a place with rich and vibrant indigenous cultures and traditions, and with Spanish and Mexican cultures and traditions. Martha Menchaca, a professor of anthropology at the University of Texas, Austin, is a scholar of Texas history and of United States Mexican culture. She joins us to explore the Spanish and Mexican origins of Texas with details from her book, The Mexican American Experience in Texas, Citizenship, Segregation, and the Struggle for Equality. Now, during our exploration of early Texas, Martha reveals details about the fall of the Mexica or Aztec Empire in 1521 and how the fall of this empire enabled the Spanish to really begin their colonization of North America. Information about the strong indigenous resistance the Spanish faced and how it took them more than 70 years to establish colonies into what is now today northern Mexico and the U.S. Southwest. And the Spanish settlement of Texas and how the establishment of Texas as a colony fit within the larger goals and contexts of the Spanish Empire, the history of Mexico, and the history of the United States. But first, research into human psychology reveals that in order to get someone to remember to do something that they heard on a podcast, a podcaster needs to remind them 27 times. So here we go. The Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios team and I could really use your help with our listener survey. Every episode we create, we create for you. So we need to know some details about you and get your advice on how we can best meet your history needs with this podcast. Taking our survey is easy. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. I think we're getting close to our 27 reminders, but I'll be sure to remind you later in this episode. All right, are you ready to explore some of Texas's early American past? Let's go meet our expert guide. Our guest is a professor of anthropology at the University of Texas, Austin. She's a specialist in the history of Texas and in U.S.-Mexican culture. She's the author of numerous books on these topics, including her most recent book, The Mexican-American Experience in Texas, Citizenship, Segregation, and the Struggle for Equality. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Martha Menchaca. Thank you. So Martha's latest book, The Mexican-American Experience in Texas, offers us an overview of Mexican-American social and economic experiences in Texas from the Spanish colonial period to the present. Martha, as we're a podcast about early American history, we're really interested in Texas's relationship with that Spanish colonial period. So would you tell us a bit about Texas in this early American context? Well, the settlement of Texas during the Spanish period was part of a royal plan to extend what was then called New Spain or Mexico today into what today is the Southwest. The colonization project began in New Mexico. Then it was followed by the plans to settle Arizona and Texas at the same time. And then later on, California. California was more difficult because of the weather storms that were very common along the coast. 
So it was part of the movement of, of the Spanish Empire. But what was very difficult for Spain was that the indigenous population was very hostile and they were preparing for intruders. It was a frontier area that many people did not want to venture into because of the fear of death, basically. And in the interior of Mexico, they had made alliances with the largest nation. They pretty much had dominated from the central area, the Aztec area, down to the Maya region in southern Mexico. But it took them about 70 years up to the 1590s to really conquer the northern region, the Chichimeca region, which was north of Mexico City, today of Tenochtitlan, and then bordered what today is the southwest. Those indigenous populations had already known about the Spanish, and there were many nations, and they were not prepared to negotiate with the Spanish. So it took quite a while. So not until the Chichimeca region was conquered could settlements be moved into what today is the Southwest. And Texas was one of those regions that was successful. It sounds like the Spanish were going to undertake and actually settle these northern areas of New Spain, which is that territory that sits north of Mexico and sprawls essentially from the U.S. West Coast into the Mississippi River Valley. It sounds like they were really reluctant settlers because of both the expansive and at times very difficult geography that would have needed to be covered to find settlements. And because you have a lot of indigenous nations that are preparing for Spanish intruders and are resistant to the idea of the Spanish creating settlements in their territories, this region that they're trying to settle does include Texas. So would you tell us more about Spanish attempts to create settlements in what we know today is Texas? They began through a process called, I would say, stepping stone through the Chimeca region. And the stronghold or the major region was what today is called the San Juan complex, in which the three missions and then a presidio were established there in the San Juan area. And then from there, this is where attempts were initiated to further explore Texas and then bring settlers from San Juan later on into Texas, which Los Adeos in 1716 and two years later to San Antonio. There had been earlier attempts of the Spanish to establish colonies in the 1690s due to the French were claiming what is Louisiana and they were trying to move into Texas. But the early attempts of the French did not succeed. And so once the French were temporarily out of the picture, then Spain decided to not continue further that far from Mexico City. So that's why the establishment first began in San Juan Bautista, which is by present day Guerrero City in Mexico. But then a few years later, around 1710, the French were very successful in establishing Natochitos, which is located along the Texas-Louisiana border. And when Natochito succeeded, Therefore, it became important for Spain now to establish other settlements, and they needed to establish settlements quite quickly. And that's when Los Adeos in the Northeast was established to counter or compete with the French that were in Atochitos. San Antonio was then established in 1718, and then La Bahia along the coast. Now that we have this overview of how and where the Spanish moved into early Texas and the fact that they were doing it in part because of their colonial rivalry with France, I wonder if we could take a further step back from this settlement and talk about why Spain wanted to be in this region of New Spain. We know that Christopher Columbus sailed on the behalf of Spain in 1492. He landed on the island of Hispaniola and then he spent a lot of time in the Caribbean. Was it through Columbus or someone else that the Spanish developed this idea that what they had really found was a continent and that they really liked to have a large presence on this North American continent? The Spanish had been exploring what is Texas and North America going back to the 1520s. Earlier before that, there were explorations that there was a continent there. But the first sustained exploration 
was the Pamphilo Narvez expiration of 1527, which ended in failure because the Indians of Florida basically forced the Spanish to retreat. And then when they were sailing uh, around Florida, there was an ocean storm which caused the ships to be wrecked and destroyed. But one of the ships made it to what historians believe is Galveston. And then several of the survivors remained in Texas. And eventually, the secretary of the expedition survived, Alvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca. And he and three other soldiers also survived. And after a long story of being taken hostage by the indigenous people in Texas, most likely the Caranco was, they were allowed to leave and to return home when they were in their trek to return back to Tenochtitlan or Mexico City by then. They met. It sounds like an unbelievable story, but they did meet. They found each other and they were just trying to return back to Mexico. Eventually, Cabeza de Vaca wrote a book, Nafraugios, or Castaways and Shipwrecks, I believe that's the full name in English, which chronicled the account of the Pamphilo Narvez expedition. Today, historians believe that, of course, he exaggerated some points in terms of giving himself much more grandeur role when it was his fellow compatriots, and especially an enslaved man called Esteban, who actually was the one that knew how to get back to Mexico. As we've been talking, we have been referencing some very powerful and very vibrant indigenous nations and communities that live in this area between Mexico City and into Texas. Would you tell us about some of these indigenous peoples who live in this vast region between Mexico and Texas? At the time that the Spanish arrived in Mexico, They arrive along the southern coast in the Maya region, and then they move through the Gulf of Mexico. And as the Med indigenous people, they were told that in central Mexico were kingdoms in what today is the Valley of Mexico or today is Mexico City, which was called the Aztec Empire, controlled by the Mexica Nation, and that they were very powerful. And what we know today is that the Aztec Empire was composed of confederation of states. So they were told that in Mexico City, there were great cities, wealth, and that if they would be able to convince the Aztec to become their allies, that Spain would be very fortunate in conquering such a powerful nation. But the fall of the indigenous people was that Many of the people outside of the Valley of Mexico or the Aztec Empire, they did not want the Aztec Empire to expand into their regions. So many of these nations became allies of the Spanish. Well, there were many nations and they assisted the Spanish to wage war against the Aztec nation, which took about three years for the Aztec to fall. So it wasn't like one battle that took place, but it was a ongoing battles that lasted about three years. In graduate school, I graded both halves of the Mexican-American history survey. One element that struck me was that a lot of these history books talk about the fall of Tenochtitlan and Hernan Cortez's conquest of this indigenous city in 1521. Martha, was the fall of Tenochtitlan the pivotal moment for the Spanish conquest and colonization of North America? Or should we really be paying attention to other dates and other events if we want to understand the Spanish colonial context of early North America? I do believe that it is the pivotal date because this is when the Aztec Empire fell, which was, according to historians, the most advanced nation in Mexico. One very important point, too, is that in Mexico had the largest number of people in Latin America and North America. It's estimated to have been over 25 million just in Mexico and in North America, maybe 10 million. So in Mexico, what they have is a Mesoamerican state system ruled by king or in the case of the Aztec and emperor. So when a nation is defeated, the people then follow the orders of the king. 
the term king is European language, but they had their specific names such as Tratoque and Tlatoani. So this is when they are told the people to stop fighting. And this is a strategy that was used by the Spanish. And that's why in Mesoamerica, the indigenous nations, in order to save their people, accepted the conquest. One of the reasons in Mexico, the Aztec are so important is because they continued to fight for a very long time. There was resistance. And even after the Aztec Empire fell in 1521, there were indigenous people who had secret movements against the Spanish. But what the Spanish did in order to promote peace is that they began to promote at the local level people who would be considered commoners. They were promoted to important positions of village chief or head legal official. They would promote some of these individuals who were basically commoners if they therefore allied themselves with Spain. And that system worked very well for the Spanish. But of course, the Spanish also wanted the elites of the different indigenous nations to remain in power in order that they would be able to justify that this is a civil conquest rather than just promoting lower level commoners into the position. So yes, I would definitely agree that that was important. But In the case of now the United States, because we're talking about the movement up, the Chichimeca people, there were six major nations. There were more nations, but there were six major nations that they already knew about the conquest and they were not willing to allow the Spanish to move forward. And they continued fighting until the 1590s when they finally fell. And once the Chichimeca region fell, then the settlements would begin into first New Mexico in 1598, and then later into the other parts of what is the United States. Could we talk more about indigenous resistance to Spanish settlement north of Tenochtitlan, or what we know today as Mexico City? How were the people of Chichimeca, the Pueblo, the Apache, and other indigenous peoples able to hold the Spanish at bay in Mexico for about 70 years? These indigenous nations really did prevent the Spanish from moving into northern Mexico, into New Mexico and Texas for 70 years or more after the fall of Tenochtitlan. And why did the Spanish decide to fight this tough indigenous resistance to try and establish settlements north of Mexico City? Why they did that? It's an empire. They want more land. And there were also information from explorers who were not officially to be in what is north of Mexico and the southwest, that they were silver in mines in the states of Cahuila and around West Texas in the southern side of Mexico. There was also information from some of the Mexica people or the Aztec people that in New Mexico, where the Pueblo region is today, that there were civilizations that were very advanced, like the Aztec. So it was believed that if they have civilization similar to the organization of Mesoamerica or the interior of Mexico, then they must also have resources. So for the Spanish, it was an attempt to maintain the resources. The main groups that the Spanish had to deal with in New Mexico were the Pueblo Indians, who had rivalries with the Navajo across in Arizona. And the Pueblo were agriculturalist people, while the Navajo were not. And they would therefore raid the harvest of the Pueblo people. And this caused problems and rivalries. So when the Spanish arrived, of course, they arrived in conquest and in war to take over. But one of the tools that the Spanish used was their old tactic of divide and conquer. They made alliances with some of the Pueblo people after defeating them that they would protect them from the Navajo raids. But the Navajo were really on their own. They remained at a distance, which for them, it was very important and that did happen because it saved them from the colonial settlements, establishing the settlements in northern Arizona. With our overview of Spanish settlement north of Mexico City and into the United States Southwest in place, in 1718, roughly 200 years after the Spanish established a foothold in Mexico, 
the Spanish established a permanent colony in Texas at San Antonio. Martha, would you tell us about San Antonio, Texas, and what purpose or designs the Spanish had for their new northern colony in New Spain? The first settlement, however, was what is called Los Adeos in the northeast. However, it was temporarily disbanded and moved to San Antonio. Once again, it was reestablished in the northeast. But San Antonio was the stronghold. In terms of the first colonists, the exact number is uncertain. There were about 78 civilian people. And then there were about 35 soldiers. With the civilian population and the soldiers altogether, there were six families that came in the settlement of San Antonio. They were brought by Governor Martin de Alarcón. And then the second colony was to be established by the missions by Father San Bonaventura Olivares, uh, known as Father Olivares. And he brought a number of missionaries. We're talking about maybe three or four. And then he brought a group of Harame Indians from San Juan. But Father Olivares never wrote how many people actually came in his colony. They were to live apart in Mission San Antonio de Valero, which is the Alamo today. And they were to live apart from the civilian population because the Spanish knew that in New Mexico, they had had many problems when the missions were established too close to the civilian settlements. So it was necessary to separate the civilian population from the mission population. The numbers we don't know exactly, but we do know that the indigenous people came from the area of San Juan along the Rio Grande border area. And a lot of these people are at the beginning of the first mission Indians in Texas. It's interesting that Father Olivares brought Harame Indians from Mexico to establish his San Antonio mission in Texas. My understanding of missions, at least in the California context, is that the Spanish used missions to convert local indigenous peoples to Catholicism. They invited Indians from the local area and sometimes coerced them to come to the mission to convert to Catholicism. And then the Catholic Church used the indigenous people who were living there. They used their labor to make mission life sustainable. At least that was the idea on paper. But we also know there was cases where the Catholic Church was using indigenous labor in these missions to enrich the church. What did you find in your research, Martha, about why some indigenous peoples in Texas seem to be attracted to the mission at San Antonio or joining other Texas missions? There's various interpretations. The frontier settlements were very expensive for Spain because of the difficulties with the indigenous populations surrounding the colonies that they were hostile towards the population, especially by the time that the number of Apaches and Comanches began to grow in very large numbers by the late 1600s, early 1700s. So some of the reasons that historians have given for the attracting the indigenous population to the missions is that the indigenous population in Texas were not unified into one nation state, but rather there were many small tribal nations. And therefore, they selected and made their own decisions whether to enter the missions or not. And some treaties were made with indigenous people to enter the missions, while sometimes other people also entered the missions when they were sick or it was an individual family. But according to the historians, the Spanish enticed some of the village chiefs to enter the missions by promising them commodities, goods. And in return, the indigenous people that sided with the Spanish were to protect the colonies from other indigenous populations. There was also policies that once indigenous people entered the missions, they were not to leave until they would be secularized, meaning that they would now be able to live among the colonial population. But that policy also applied to the colonial population. Once you agreed to enter, 
and be part of a colony, you could not leave. Why? Because it was very expensive for the Spanish crown to establish these colonies. So therefore, by law, no one could leave once they were in the colonies. I don't know how he would like that, the inability to (laughs) leave a colony that I moved to and then found I didn't like. Now, my understanding of early Spanish colonial settlements is that they were established in three parts. And we've talked about some of these parts. First, there was a mission which housed the Catholic Church, and that church served as the ecclesiastical function of the town. Second, we have a presidio, which housed both the town's government, so your governor would have lived there, and served as your town's protection, because that is where the soldiers lived. And then the third entity, which we've also mentioned, was the actual town of civilians, who might have farms on outlying areas of the town, or who might work in the town as tradespeople, like blacksmiths or brickmakers, or even, you know, as merchants themselves. Martha, is that how we should imagine the setup of this early Spanish settlement in San Antonio? Yes. The first settlers that came with Governor Alarcón and with the missionaries, there were civilians among them, but they were the presidial families, the families following the soldiers. And they established the Villa de Bejar at the same time that the San Antonio de Valero was established. But according to the records is that most of these people were either criollo second, third generation frontiers people, and that the majority of them were mixed race people, that they were mestizo or afro-mestizo. Afro-mestizo is the term for various mixtures of Spanish, Indian, and white. But in the 1730s, the colony was sent from the Canary Islands to San Antonio to govern the colonial population that was already in San Antonio. And this colony believed that they should have superior rights over the first settlers because they had been given royal orders to establish the town council and then to establish the Villa de San Fernando. So they attempted to exclude the first settlers. And many historians have stated that their exclusion was based on the first settlers were mixed race people, as opposed to that they considered themselves Spanish when they were really from the Canary Islands. So there was major conflicts that eventually ended when the children of the Canary Islanders and the children of the first settlers intermarry and the two separate villages of San Antonio eventually merge into just what is considered San Antonio. But you have the different districts of where the Canary Islanders originally lived and then where the presidial families lived. I know we'd like to talk about the structure and governance of settlements in colonial Texas, but I'd also like to highlight a difference that I'm hearing in the establishment of colonial settlements. So in the British and East Coast contexts of early American history, we know that Europeans came to North America and they established communities just like those they'd left behind in Europe. So we'd see English farming villages in New England or Virginia or a German community in Pennsylvania or even a Dutch community in early New York, New Jersey or Delaware. And over time, we know that these early white Europeans married each other, and then their sons and daughters move west into the interior of North America, especially during the 19th century. Whereas the story of Spanish colonization in North America sounds different. It wasn't really white people of European Spanish descent who migrated to North America and then looked to establish new Spanish settlements north of Mexico, but really a mixture of Spanish people who had grown up perhaps in Latin America likely with parents of different Spanish, indigenous, or African backgrounds, and who could have been a generation or so removed from the initial intermixing of races and ethnicities. And these were the people who served as colonists, establishing Spanish footholds north of Mexico. And I guess what I'm trying to point out here is that it sounds like Spanish colonization north of Mexico was a much more diverse and multi-ethnic project than the colonization project that we typically hear about from North America's eastern seaboard? Well, Spain had practiced what is called today la casta system, a legal racial order, which separated the populations based on race with Spaniards holding the highest prestige and having many privileges. And within the Spaniards, they were divided into those who were born in Europe and those who were born in Latin America. Then were the mestizos, and the Afro-Mestizos, who were the mixed-race people, 
their status really depended upon who was the father, their family history. Then you had the Indians, the indigenous communities, and they were also divided into indigenous communities that had retained their autonomy after the conquest and they had retained their land. And then there were the indigenous communities that were part of the similar systems as the missions in the interior of Mexico. And then you had a lot of indigenous people who were very poor as a result of the conquest of having lost their land. And then you had enslaved people that were also brought to New Spain. But New Spain, the system was very flexible. The children of enslaved men were born free. And this population were therefore allowed to intermarry with the indigenous people and with the mestizos people. And that's why in Mexico, you had a large number of mixed race people who are a part of African descent. Mexico, due to the church, the specific administrators of the Catholic Church in that region, they lobbied for the slave trade to end very early in Mexico, unlike other places of Latin America, such as Cuba and Puerto Rico. Based on a long history of the loss in Mexico, there was a very large mixed race people. And a lot of the individuals who wanted more privileges chose to move into what is the Southwest because in the Southwest, La Casa system was very flexible. What Spain needed and what the local administrators needed were people who were going to establish colonies, like you were saying, in terms of the mercantile and blacksmiths, shoe cobblers, weavers, masonry, and a lot of people who were of mixed heritage. And then also Spaniards who were married to mixed race people. They wanted the special privileges because it was flexible. It was not as strict as in the interior. In Mexico, the caste system evolves and becomes very lax also by, I would say, the late 1700s, early 1800s. And eventually, why you have wars of independence in Mexico in 1821 is to get rid of the caste system that is still lingering on and giving the Europeans all the power over commerce. In the United States, we often talk and think about citizenship and who gets to be a citizen of the United States. And if we take a step back from this conversation, we can look to its origins around 1776. And we've talked to other scholars about this. And historians always like to point to 1776 for when this conversation really got going. But it sounds like while that may be true for the small portion of the United States that's linked to the eastern seaboard, it sounds like the question of who could be a full-fledged citizen or member of these colonial communities in the Spanish Empire and what is today the United States west of the Mississippi River really had their origins before 1776. Yes. What people did and what the archives and then the census records indicate is that people were allowed to pass for either being criollo or being a mestizo in order to have greater social status. And what you see in some of the census records is that a person over the years of their life would move from being a mulatto or person of black and white heritage to then move to being a mestizo and then to a criollo. They could never be considered to be European or peninsular because that usually it was only the fathers and the high level administrators that were peninsular. But there was that mobility. And what they were doing, I would say, in Texas was that they were creating who is part of this community. And the word Espanol or Spanish was not really solely about race, but rather is that they were Spanish subjects. And then the administrators allowed people to see themselves as Spanish subjects, regardless of their race. Yeah, there always does seem to be a difference between how the laws were written and designed in European seats of empire and how they were actually applied in colonial areas where they actually couldn't be enforced unless you had local cooperation. Yes. Martha, you mentioned the wars for independence. And before we get into those wars and what it meant for the United States, we should take a moment to thank our episode sponsor. The Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios team and I would really like to get to know you better. Rather than being a nameless, faceless download number, please take our listener survey and help us get to know you as a real person. In our survey, you can also tell us what you like about Ben Franklin's world, what you dislike, and what show features you'd like to see us add or change. 
The Innovation Studios team and I produce this podcast for you. So please visit benfranklinsworld.com slash survey and tell us how we can better serve you. Let us know your thoughts about this show. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Thank you for taking our survey. And I think we're getting closer to the 27 reminders I need to give to help people remember to take our survey. Martha, I wonder if you would tell us a bit about how Mexico and Spain governed their colonies in Texas in and, and what is now the United States Southwest. What was the structure of governance that people in Texas and the Southwest eventually dismantled when there were these Mexican wars for independence between 1810 and 1821? Well, Latin America was divided into what is called five audiencias or five governing districts. And then the administrators of each district would then interpret the laws. Then Spain had the Council of the Indies, which would oversee the establishment of the laws in Latin America. Mexico was Latin America's or Spain's main region of control because it was the wealthiest and the most highly populated. And they had the viceroy live in Mexico City. So the viceroy, his power or authority changes over time from being total control of New Spain to just having control of Mexico City. So it really changes over time in terms of at the local level when the advisors of the viceroy and the committees of all the different districts or what would be the states today, what power they had. But the main control, of course, always came from the king and then the Council of the Indies, which had one main administrator that had the most power And then they, of course, had the viceroy who governed New Spain. And they also had a second viceroy other times in Latin America to cover Peru and the other regions. But then over time, also the military system changed to give greater control to the military and away from the administrators. Because by the mid-1750s, late 1770s, the Criollos, who were native-born Spaniards, were gaining a lot of control over the population, and Spain wanted to curtail their power, so they instituted a military system, which placed the military to oversee all of these councils and the power of the Criollos. And this really angered the Criollos, because they were attempting to gain more power, and then the crown was going in the opposite direction. This sounds like a familiar story for those of us who live in the United States, because these events sound similar to events during the American Revolution, where British American colonists engage their imperial government in a debate about home rule and who gets to rule at home. And it sounds like there was a similar debate that took place within the Spanish Empire between the Criollos and the Spanish government. Exactly. And then when the military was given more control, Spain began to place more restrictions over trade in Latin America between the different nations. And then also Spain was in conflict with Great Britain and eventually the United States and then with France. And this was causing a greater taxation of Latin America and with Mexico being its main colony, the taxation was growing. And so with the Mexican people, with the taxation, the greater restrictions on the Criollos, and then the masses saying, why do we even have a caste system? The preparation for independence was brewing, and it had already started in other places in Latin America. But Mexico, since it was the most important colony or the wealthiest colony of Spain, it was central to Spain not to lose Mexico. And yet, Spain did lose Mexico. 300 years after the Spanish conquered Tenochtitlan in 1521, the Spanish period of governance in Texas and Mexico came to an end with Mexican independence in 1821. Martha, would you tell us about Mexican independence and the types of rights that the people of Mexico were fighting for? The call for independence took place in 1810, issued by Father Hidalgo. And he called for the overthrow of Spanish rule or tyranny and the end of the casta system. 
of course, Spain squashed the independent movement, but it couldn't stop it. Then one of the major events that takes place is 1810, in which France has invaded Portugal and Spain and kidnapped the monarch that then the Spanish parliament takes over and they do not want to lose Mexico or Latin America. So they hold constitutional reforms, conferences. A lot of this is based on administrators from Mexico talking, and then they will have the conventions where more people participate. They're doing this while the king is away. And what they plan is to give the people of Latin America citizenship. But the question is the differences of opinion of the Spaniards versus the people of Latin America. Spain only wanted to give indigenous people citizenship and Spaniards because they believed that the indigenous people were the majority and they wanted to cater to them. They knew that without the indigenous people, they would lose the colonies. So they wanted to give them citizenship. But the Spanish did not want to give citizenship to any of the mixed race people, the mestizos and the Afro-mestizos, because they said in the conventions of Cadiz State that their concern was that the mixed race people would become the representatives of the indigenous people. And they will always side with the criollos, with the Latin Americanist ideals, not with Spain. So there were the major debates about not allowing mixed race people to be citizens. But eventually it was concluded that they would be allowed to be citizens. There was an issue, however, of people of African descent that only if they were in the military would they automatically get citizenship. But then they would have to come and apply for citizenship if they were respectful people. That was the provision for people of African descent. But once Mexico obtains its independence in 1821, it establishes many of the ideals of the American Revolution in terms of the court system, the separation of the House and the Senate. But the main difference is that citizenship is given to all people, irrespective of race. And this included in the Southwest, the Native American people who were still hostile towards the Spanish, such as the case of Texas, the Comanche, and the Apache. So that is the major difference with Mexican independence, is that there was an evolutionary process to extend citizenship to everyone very early on. When we zoom out and look at the Spanish empire as a whole, Texas really seems to be this far-flung outpost that played a minor role within the far-flung and large Spanish empire. But once Mexico achieved its independence in 1821, how did the role of Texas change? What was the role that Texas played within the much smaller Mexican nation? Texas, one can say in terms of the general history of Mexico, played a minor role as it was a frontiers colony. It was not like Mexico City, where the vast fortunes were established. The significance of Texas is that the United States is located so close to Mexico and Texas is the border area. And the United States was very much aware of the natural resources that Texas had. The Spanish, during the Spanish period and the Mexican period, especially the missionaries, but also the colonial populations, they had brought large herds of animals thousands upon thousands of cattle and horses. And the United States knew this, that Texas was rich in natural resources and all this animal stock that had been brought in by the Spanish and Mexican people. So very early on, when Mexico in 1810, a couple of years later, the revolutionaries were attempting to obtain aid from the United States to help them fight for independence, the United States was willing to provide aid to Mexico if, after the War of Independence, Texas was turned over to the United States. And the revolutionaries said, no, this is Mexico. And that did not go forward. And from that period on, there were attempts by the United States, which eventually leads to the annexation of Texas to the United States a few decades later. 
But the cattle industry, the growth of the cattle in Texas is a major reason why this industry was important for the United States. One of the curious things about Texas history, at least to me, is that Mexico tried to use Texas as a buffer region between itself and the United States. As you say, Texas occupied this region between the westward expanding United States and the newly independent country of Mexico. And so to create this buffer region, Mexico went ahead and invited Stephen F. Austin and other Anglo-Americans to settle in Texas as Mexican citizens so that they could serve as this buffer between the two countries. Yes, once independence took place, Mexico needed the settlers to protect the frontiers from the indigenous populations. What we have in Texas is not just the Comanche and Apache, but many other tribes had moved in to the region, especially to North Texas. So Mexico then opened up its immigration to the United States. Spain had prohibited immigration from Mexico But it was in the process of shifting, too, because Spain had given a contract to Moses Austin, Stephen Austin's father. But the idea was that the frontier would be settled by people from the United States and, of course, from Mexican people in attempt to defend the region. So, yes, definitely Mexico opened the door to the entry of a population who later on wanted to remain separate from Mexico, especially once Mexico began its constitutional debate over slavery in 1824. In 1824, it gave all the states in Mexico to determine whether to abolish slavery immediately or not. By that time, Texas had a large number of Anglo-American residents, about 2,000, and they favored slavery. So what ensues in Texas is the debate over slavery in which Mexico completely abolishes it in 1829. And the Anglo-American settlers felt betrayed because when they first began to immigrate to Texas, slavery had been allowed. So the eruption over slavery does become the main contention between the Texas independent Anglo-Americans when they're seeking independence and then the Mexican government. There were a lot of negotiations that took place in between, but the point that led to the separation was this major debate over slavery. There were other issues dealing with taxation, but those were the compromises later on that Mexico made in 1830 to prevent dissent in Texas. There was also issues over land that the Anglo-American population Those people who had not immigrated and registered themselves in the empresario offices that they were immigrants from Texas, they were not to receive land. But then Mexico amended that when, you know, they were outnumbered by the number of settlers that had come in. It's estimated that by around Texas independence, there were at least 30,000 Anglo-American settlers that were now living in Texas. And the Mexican population is estimated around 7,000. Texas did develop into this largely Anglo-American region of Mexico. And as you mentioned, there were several disagreements and contentions between Mexico and the people living in Texas, with slavery being the most major contention. So in 1835, the people of Texas fight a war for independence, and Texans secured their independence from Mexico. Martha, what was the independent Republic of Texas like? And what led to this independent republic's annexation to the United States in 1845. I would say what led to the Texas annexation to the United States was security, funding, and then also patriotism of the former immigrants who now had their own republic to the United States. The main change that takes place after Texas independence is that the government legalizes the land of the people who have settled in Texas and did not have property issued by the Mexican government. So they're given land. The process is not completed until about 1840. But then also the government declares that all people living in the Republic of Texas are citizens 
as long as they were not Black or Indian. And Indian was defined as being more of Mission Indians or part of the indigenous populations who were not part of Mexico. So citizenship and land were two of the most important aspects that changed after Texas obtained its independence. What followed was a lot of legal battles over land. Where were the boundaries of the land grants? Many Mexicans had to go to court to have their titles perfected because people were settling on their land. A lot of these issues over the legality of the Mexican land grants are really not settled until Texas becomes part of the U.S. government and the laws of the United States are placed in terms of contracts and deeds. In the court state, you just can't take people's land because this also affected the very early Anglo-American settlers who had obtained their land grants during the Mexican period. They had the same exact titles as the Mexican people. Those were changes that took place during the early republic, too. They had to settle marriage law. The Anglo-American settlers had married under Mexican law. So it was necessary to uphold Mexican law in terms of marriage, because if not, children who were born in families that had been contracted during Mexican rule would be considered illegitimate and they would not be able to inherit from their parents. So marriage law changed. That was very important for the Afro-Mexicanos because When the marriage laws were upheld to be legal, the Texas Republic and then later on the U.S. had to accept that if people who were white had married black people or people of partial African descent, those marriages were legal. Those laws, of course, are later on amended by the U.S. Supreme Court after the Civil War. But those were important points. Transfer of money in terms of the Anglo-American population purchasing the stores and property of the Mexican population. And changes begin to take place. The Mexican population becomes a minority population. Slavery also increased during the Texas stage of a republic. It's estimated that it had been 5,000 enslaved people owned by Anglo-Americans before independence, and it had grown within 20 years to over 55,000. So slavery increased substantially in Texas. The Independent Republic of Texas was fairly short-lived. Texas became the 28th state of the United States in 1845. Martha, we've talked a lot about early Texas history, and my East Coast experience, mostly the Northeast Coast experience, has been that when we Americans think and talk about Mexican-American people today, we are typically talking about people who are just a generation or two removed from moving to the United States from Mexico. And in your book, The Mexican-American Experience in Texas, you make a really interesting point. So I wonder if you would tell us how you think our ideas about Mexican-American people today change when we consider that Mexican-American history is really part of the larger history of Spain, Spanish colonization in North America, and part of early Texas history. One of the reasons in my book that I started with the Spain is to examine the early colonial presence of the ancestors of the Mexican population. There's different interpretations of how many people exactly of Mexican descent were living in the entire Southwest. Estimates are around 100,000, but we're dealing from California to Texas. And then also part of the 100,000 are Mission Indians, so a mixture. But the migrations of the Mexican people really increase radically during the Mexican Revolution of 1910, when thousands of people leave Mexico during the war. And what had taken place is that in Mexico, there had been a dictator, Porfirio Diaz, who, acting with U.S. businessmen, bankrupted the economy and got rid of basically all labor rights, which eventually led to a revolution. And this is where we get the names of Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata. So the Mexican-American people are divided generationally. 
in terms of many people have the roots going back to the Spanish colonial settlements or the mission Indian populations. Other people go back to the period of the Mexican Revolution. And then up to 1964, the United States really wanted immigration from Mexico until it closed its doors. It was ongoing immigration. So many of the people whose parents came in the 60s, they will be first or second generation. And of course, due to that Mexico so close to the United States and the economy is very different, the immigration continues to be an issue of population movements. We should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Martha, in your opinion, what might have happened if Texans had decided to abolish slavery and remained part of Mexico? If Texans had been able to make compromise work, how might the histories of Texas, Mexico, and the United States be different today? That would have been great for any people to accept that slavery was wrong. Of course, Texas would have remained part of Mexico, but, you know, there were already Anglo-Americans in Cahuila. But there were other Anglo-Americans that became Mexican, people who immigrated at the same time as the Anglo-Americans into Texas. My personal perspective is that it wouldn't have mattered that the United States wanted to expand its borders to California and to Texas. So they would have acquired it anyway, because Mexico, after its independence, it developed and institutionalized a great philosophy in terms of political rights and citizenship, but it was bankrupt. It had very little money to protect itself. And after independence, the United States tries, but takes the entire northern border region. And then France comes in in the 1860s, trying to take over more of Mexico. So I would say that eventually the United States would have acquired Texas by war because of the natural resources that it had. Martha, now that your book, The Mexican-American Experience in Texas, is out in the world, what is your current research project about? Right now, I wanted to do some more detailed history on the settlers of San Antonio and try to use the writings of individuals who were not governors, who were not elites, but who were mid-level individuals who wrote and then tried to use that history to write about the interactions of the community. What were their conflicts? What were the sources of community? I'm doing much more detailed work of shorter periods right now of San Antonio dealing from its founding 1718 to around 1760, and really focusing on the community. And where is a good place for us to reach out to you if we have more questions about this early period of Texas history or about the Mexican-American experience in Texas? I'm a professor of anthropology, and so the best place to contact me would be in the Department of Anthropology, the University of Texas at Austin. Martha Menchaca, Thank you for taking us through the early history of Texas. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Traditional histories of the United States often begin with Christopher Columbus, and then they move into the history of English and British America, the American Revolution, and the early United States. These stories move just like the United States' physical expansion as a nation moved, from East Coast to West Coast. But the reality is that the colonial American experience and colonial American history did not always move from east to west, nor did it all start with English or British America. When we talk about the colonial American period for what is now the United States, only about 12 present-day states have a colonial history that began with the English. Even some of the original 13 colonies that we associate with English America, I'm thinking here of New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, 
have colonial contexts that began with other European powers, such as the Netherlands and Sweden. And far more states are like Texas, where their colonial origins begin in the Spanish Empire. And as Martha revealed, the movement of people who established Spanish colonies in North America did not move from east to west, but from multiple directions, with the largest movement of colonial settlement spreading from south to north. Our conversation with Martha shows us that for many states, especially states within the United States Southwest, we must seriously consider pausing for at least a moment to place these states within their indigenous Spanish and Mexican origins. Doing so helps us see the different roles that different American states and regions played in the period's European empires. It also helps us see how and why different regions of the United States have different histories, cultures, and American populations. As Martha noted, White Europeans and Anglo-Americans did not initially play a role in establishing settlements and culture in Texas or in the early American Southwest. Instead, this work was done by an indigenous and mixed-race population of Native Americans, mestizos, who were people of Spanish and indigenous parentage, Creoles, people of Spanish and white colonial ancestry, Afro-Indigenous people, and people who came from a mixture of all of these different races that the Spanish outlined in their casta system of racial hierarchy. History is the evidence-based study of past people and societies, and how people in their societies have changed over time. This is what gives history the power to tell us who we are and how we came to be who we are as a people and as a society. While much of the United States' past is filled with Anglo-American origins as the United States' population expanded west from the Atlantic seaboard, it's also true that large parts of the United States also have deep and rich histories that predate their Anglo-American origins. Texas offers us just one example of those states. You'll find more information about Martha, her book, The Mexican-American Experience in Texas, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com 381. Friends help friends remember to take their favorite podcasts, listener surveys. So friend, please help us out by taking our listener survey. You'll find the survey at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Katie Schinebeck, Ashley Bognight, and Morgan McCullough. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, We have many more states with French and Spanish origins that we need to cover. So which of these states' early American past do you think we should explore next? Send me your answers. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.